All right, so I'm excited to give my second bar camp talk. This one is called Quantified Selfie, Overanalyzing the Data of Your Life. And so the reason I decided on this topic was bar camp's all about sharing your passion, sharing things that you kind of uniquely alone are, are really into, uh, and like sharing that ha passion with others. Um, it's a perfect venue. Um, people at bar camp I found are very supportive and very open-minded as far as what other people like um, our, our interests and they also like um, exploring other hobbies. So uh, my hobby is data analysis. That's my job. I'm a data scientist. Um, and I realized recently that I, I track a lot of things. I do a lot of like personal data analytics. And one of my friends was like, hey, what are you, uh, why are you always on your phone? Are, are you doing that tracking thing again? And then that's when I realized that I actually spend probably too much time overanalyzing my life. But it's kind of fun. And I want to show you how you can also do it in a few easy steps. So as a data scientist, like whatever profession you're in, you look in the world in that scope. If you're an engineer, you'd see the engineering in a building. If you're an English major, you're a literary background, you, you see, you see the, the beauty in um, literary works. If you're a data scientist, life is data. Everything that you do produces data. And life is data, and so therefore data is also life. Um, and with this kind of mentality, uh, in 2015, I decided that I wanted to make a conscious effort towards tracking more things in my life so I could do statistical analysis on it because it's what I find to be fun. Not a lot of people find this to be fun, but I like, I like to think it's fun. Um, so yeah, my 2015 goal was to track all the things, all the things I could reasonably do that would shed insight. I, do, I wouldn't want to track things that were kind of like miscellaneous or wouldn't give me value, but I wanted to track things that could, in theory, give me valuable insight into my life. But is it worth it? This is a question that's really important to ask in the beginning. Is it even worth it? Is this all this effort even worth it? Um, XKCD has a very good um, re relevant uh, comic on it, um, and I would like you guys to read it now. So I think the moral of this is as long as, as, long as you don't let data tracking take over your life, you should be good, but at the same time, um, you can also track different relationships in ways that you, you wouldn't even believe. I've looked into it. Um, with that said, here are the eight things we're going to cover today um, that I track now. Um, and I track more than this, but these are the eight that I found would probably be most useful for you guys to hear about. So car, personal movement, beer consumption, finances, running productivity, music, health, and fitness. OK, a brief aside, uh, there's a difference between passive tracking and active tracking. Passive tracking is tracking that you have like on your phone that does it in the background. Um, I'll show you some passive tracking me methods that are super useful. You don't have to do anything. It's all in the background. Active tracking is like a manual process. It's very much like a journal. You have to consciously make an effort to, to track things. And there can be very um, beneficial things from active tracking, but it does require a little bit of effort and some disciplined focus when you're doing this. Brief aside number two, APIs are a major key. Um, with a lot of the data that I track, I use um, APIs to interface with um, the, my data securely to look at my um, data and reporting in new ways that are, that are both insightful but also secure. So APIs are application programming interfaces, and they allow other analytical websites to access secure data from, say, your bank or your running profile or whatever your, your data is stored. It allows these third-party sites to access your data and do cool stuff with them. So first of all, car tracking with automatic. Automatic is a, a little um, plug-in you plug into your car port that you might not even know you have. It's a, called an OBD port. Um, it's this little port underneath um, your wheel, typically. And it allows you to have access to all this rich information your car produces, as long as it's from 1995 and above. Um, it produces all this rich information that's typically only used by car mechanics. But here's some things that Automatic um, has taught me since installing it a month ago. Um, it provides a map, as long as it's paired with your, your phone that has GPS. So this is a map of Omaha I've driven in the past month. Um, I've had 25 miles per gallon. It's estimated how um, much gas I've spent based on these miles per gallon. It takes all my trips. Um, but Automatic also does some really other, cool other things. Um, in the last month, I've taken a couple road trips. Um, and as long as I have this app on, it will make a map of the entire US on, on the county map. 
Um, and so I'm really excited to continue to drive with it and maybe one day hit up all the states, counties, which is a bit ambitious, but it's cool that it tracks this. Additionally, Automatic allows you to see how your driving um, styles are compared to other people with the same cars as you and like how you can best optimize your car. So I have a Subaru Impreza and I drive it a little bit fast because you can tell the, by the, my fuel efficiency is a bit lower than the average Subaru Impreza um, at certain speeds um, because I tend to drive it like a race car. Um, and this is another insight. This, this shows you um, horsepower at different RPMs and speeds compared with your car, car's model with other cars of the same model in different years. Um, I max out at 53 horsepower. Um, it's not a very high-powered car. Um, but as you can see, the average car on the right of my model um, has much uh, faster speeds. Um, another thing Automatic allows you to see is how much of the environment you're killing, which is kind of, you know, interesting. You wouldn't be able to see this otherwise. And so in the last month, I've, dri I've driven about 3,000 miles, and, which resulted in 2,000 pounds of CO2 emissions, and it would take 301 trees um, a tenth of a year to displace that carbon I produced, which is a lot of trees. Um, so that's pretty neat. I wouldn't have known that before, and now I know actively how many trees I am, um, in effect, killing by just driving around. All right, moving on to movement tracking. Um, so there's this app called Moves that you can use to passively track your GPS location. Um, and then when you pair that with an online tool called Movoscope, you can get some really rich and detailed maps that are super cool and really tell a story of your life that you might not be able to see any other way. So this is the Moves interface. You download it. It, in the background, tracks your location. You have to go in and select what these sites are. So this morning, I went in and, and found Kaneko on the list. It pulls from Facebook's location APIs to deliver rich location-based um, detailed information. It also tracks if you're running, walking, or, or in a car or other, um, like a, a bicycle, it tracks that. It's really smart, and it, um, these are the maps it produces with Moviscope. So this is the last year and a half of me driving around Omaha. Um, I could talk a lot about this map in particular, but I don't have a lot of time. There are, you can tell there are like certain hubs, like where I worked at one point, where I worked at a different point, where I went to school at, when I was in school when I started this. Um, it's just really cool. I would, this is like something that we, we all produce. We all produce data, but you wouldn't be able to see it without this type of visualization tool. Similarly, this is a walking map of downtown Omaha um, of the past year. Um, you can probably tell where Creighton's at. You can tell where I live based on the, the majority of like the green walking patterns there. And then, as you can see, um, I frequent the old market area, but don't go much further than that. Uh, this is a zoomed out map of um, some places I've been in the U.S. in the past year and a half. As you can tell, um, the, the small mini dots are places I had to stop for gas stations. And so if we go and look at the transportation view, we can see this is, uh, it's kind of hard to tell, but I took a, a big road trip through the south and then I had some flights to um, New York and I also went to Denver. And the big one in the middle is Omaha. Super cool. And then um, after my senior year, I went to Europe, and this is a, a visualized um, kind of of my a visualization of my Europe trip. Started in London, went to Amsterdam, went down through Germany, Austria, back to Germany, back to London. Um, and you know, like it's kind of gonna be cool in like 10, 15 years when I can say like, oh yeah, I went to Europe, and this is exactly what I did. Like, there's no, this is the data. This is exactly what I did on the, on this Europe trip. All right, moving on to alcoholism or alcohol tracking with Untapped and Beer Match. So last year I gave a talk at um, Bar Camp about Untapped data analysis, and in the, that time I found that there was actually an online tool that did that analysis way better than I did for free. Um, so I was kind of glad I didn't find that before I gave the talk last year. But um, this is what Untapped is. If you're unfamiliar, Untapped is a great. Um, beer check-in app where you can check in a wide variety of beers. I, I did not look at the name of that beer. I just pulled a random um, picture from the internet. I don't know. There's a lot of weird na beer names. This is what you find out when you are in the craft beer industry, apparently. Um, you got to differentiate yourself. But anyway, you check in your beer. This is a manual check-in um, data processing process. So um, 
what you do with this is then you go to this um, beer match app, which uses the API of your untapped data to give you some rich reports about what your preferred beers are, how you rate them, and a bunch of other cool statistics. Uh, so for instance, here you can tell that an IPA, um, American IPA, I both strongly rate it and have checked it in a bunch of times. Um, and additionally, it, there's just like a ton of rich, um, rich reports that this gives just for free. It's, it's really crazy that people, um, that this, this developer just created it for free. And I was trying to do it all the time um, last year, but I, I was fortunate to have found it. Uh, I have PBR as a five star. I think I did that as a joke once, but now, um, now this, this app thinks that's my preferred beer. I really should change that rating, but um, you know, maybe it is the best. I don't know. Um, and then with this, with this app, you can also ch um, compare beer ratings with other people on Untap. So this was the whole point of my talk last year, but um, this does it super well as well. You can um, compare. You t it pulls down data from one of your friends and your data and matches it up. This is um, a, a comparison with me and one of my friends that, is a, that drinks quite a bit more than I do. Um, but you can tell we're pretty, pretty similar style-wise, just not in quantity consumed. All right, moving on to personal finance tracking with Mint. Now, I know this could be its, an, its own talk. In fact, it's its own industry, personal finance. But I think the best way to get into this type of tracking is just to get a Mint account. Mint is a great free tool that allows you to sync your um, bank accounts with it and gives rich reporting um, on a wide array of uh, topics. Budgeting, it does trends over time, it, it shows you how to, it helps you save. And I could spend a lot of time on, on Mint, but I just want to kind of show you um, one insight I got from tracking my finances over time. Um, and this, it kind of has to do with beer and uh, finances. It's that um, my last year, my last semester, the, I found that as the, the final, as the months decreased towards graduation, my spending at my local favorite bar linear, linearly increased. And so I wouldn't have known that without Mint. So that was a kind of a, a fun insight I found just by keeping a budget, just by using Mint and uh, tracking my spending over time. Um, yeah, I have since spent even more at the, at the moon. I, I, don't, I don't know if, it, if that spending has decreased, and so it's uh, a cautionary tale as well. Uh, moving on to running tracking with Strava and Smash Run. So I like to run a lot, so I like to run with my iPhone, and I track my runs using my iPhone's GPS um, um, functionality. The, my, preferred use, my preferred app is called Strava. Um, it's kind of a social app. It, you can like interface with a bunch of other runners in your community, and it kind of keeps it competitive. Um, so, so this is what Strava looks like. Well, this is um, one aspect of Strava is the Strava heat map. So this is it takes all my runs and overlays them to to create like hot hot spots of running. So this is over the past three years. This is like primarily where I've run in Omaha, um, and it's kind of cool to see like I like I in theory know this because I've run all of these, but it's it kind of is awesome to, to see from like a high level like what the data actually is telling me. Uh, this is where I've run. This is where this is this is this is these are my running trails. Um, I use Smash Run to pull data from Strava. I use Strava's API, and then I do even further analytics because why not? And you, there's just so much more you can do um, by looking um, at different metrics compared to each other. And Smash Run really motivates me to run faster, to like to to run farther and knowing certain metrics and insights allow me to get an edge when I'm running. For instance, one I learned recently is that um, when the relative humidity is above 90, my performance decreases by like 60%. So basically all of August, this past, this past like five weeks, I have been like underperforming just because it's been so, so humid out. Um, and that's something I wouldn't have learned if I, weren't, if I wasn't tracking my data in this way. Um, another th moving on to productivity or a lack thereof um, tracking with rescue time. Um, rescue time is a really neat um, background. It's a passive app. You install it in your browser or on your desktop, and it tracks what windows you have open. It tracks what um, what websites you're going to. Some people might not like this idea because they kind of want to like be like private, um, and I totally understand that. But 
it, it also gives some really cool um, analysis as to what it, it automatically classifies your time as being productive, neutral, or unproductive, and then gives you a productivity score. So you can see if like, oh, was I actually productive or was I actually on Reddit for the past six hours? It'll tell you that. Um, so this past week, for instance, I was, um, I spent most of my time in communication scheduling. I did a, some design and composition, social networking, news and opinion, and then uncategorized. And I had a productivity pulse of 46, which is um, probably not super as productive as I'd want to be. Uh, but it's kind of cool because this, this keeps you accountable. It allows you to see what you're actually doing instead of saying, oh, yeah, I, I, was, I, I did a lot this afternoon, and then realizing you were actually on Facebook the whole time. This gives you that accountability. Um, moving on to music, I track my music with Last.fm. Um, Last.fm, you can, put, you can uh, download an app on your computer that will automatically, it's called scrobbling. It like, basically like, scrapes all the plays on your iPhone or I, um, your computer or your or iPod. I'm not sure if there's one for Android or PC, but um, at least there is for Mac. And basically, this takes your entire music library and what you're actually listening to and, and displays it on its website in uh, reports that you can look at as the past 90 days, the past 30 days, the past week, the past um, year, the past however long. And you can see what you're actually listening to. Um, I think there's works for um, Last.fm to work with Spotify, but I'm not 100% sure yet. A really cool feature I found from um, Last.fm's um, API is called the, the mainstream factor, and it may basically tells you how mainstream you are based on your, your music listens. It gives all, your, all the artists you listen to different weights based on how relatively mainstream they are, and then gives you a score. So apparently in the past three months, I am uh, only 24% mainstream, uh, which means I'm quote unquote cool. I disagree with that. Um, I, I don't know. Some of these, I think, should be more mainstream, but <coughs> kind of interesting. But yeah, I wouldn't know that. I wouldn't know how mainstream I was if I didn't track this data. So that's uh, a valuable insight that affects my day-to-day -day life, kind of. <laughs> um, and then finally, the last big thing that um, I track is kind of like a meta tracker. It's an aggregator of a bunch of small other trackers that creates a really cool, um, a really cool interface. Uh, it's called Gyroscope. It's this uh, small company from Silicon Valley that um, really just aggregates a bunch of your data. So let me go here first. It takes the, all these inputs and creates a, a personalized, like, quantified self dashboard for you. So it takes, for me, it takes Strava. It could take Fitbit, Moves, um, Apple health data from your Apple Watch or, or your phone. It even takes social media um, accounts, too, like Instagram, Twitter, Foursquare. Um, and it takes rescue time, which are some things we've touched on earlier. And it creates this really beautiful um, interface so you can check it daily and see just exactly what's going on. So for instance, this is uh, my running uh, report. Um, and you can see like the days I've run and my overall trend. Um, I could have given a whole talk on got gyroscope, but like there are there are so many cool reports on here. If you want to get started with Quantified Self, start tracking anything, I'd highly recommend a Gyroscope account. Um, you can, it's a great place to start, and they have a lot of great um, tutorials to walk you through how to do Quantified Self. Um, you can see that you can even, it's even interactive, and it has a multiplayer mode, kind of. You add your friends, so um, I have some of my friends here. Ben, you really, you really need to step up your, your steps average here. Um, but yeah. Gyroscope is super cool. Um, and then here's some, it has a, they just released an, uh, a mobile app. And these are some of the cards, uh, is what they, they're called, these personalized health statistics cards. So you can see the top middle is the rescue time data, productive and unproductive. You can uh, have specific workout um, cards with your, your heart rate throughout. And then in the top left, it's a, kind of a, like a move-a-scope map where you see where, where you've been in a city. It gives like weekly city reports. Just a really cool app. They're doing a lot of cool things. They're always updating stuff. And so if there's one thing you can take away, I would recommend going to um, Gyroscope. Um, currently only available for iPhone. And, um, but you can, you can also do the web version. There's not an Android uh, mobile app yet, but it's super, super cool if you can, if you can use it on iPhone. 
So in summary, I track a bunch of stuff, my car, my personal movement, my beer consumption, my finances, my running, my productivity, my music, and health and fitness, and more. There's, believe it or not, there are other things I track that I didn't think I would have time to cover and maybe weren't all that interesting. I don't even know if any of this was interesting to you, but um, I, I, th I think it's, it can be valuable, even if you just choose one of these to track, um, to, to shed some insight. And you shouldn't do it all at once. This probably took me like a year and a half to two years just to gradually, I just gradually added one after the other. Um, but it's kind of cool if you, you can have a report on your, on your day, on your week, on your month, um, and see your life in a way that you maybe didn't see it before. Um, but is it worth it? Again, there are some consequences to, to graphing everything. Um, but I think, I, think it's, uh, I think it's well worth the risk if you can, uh, if you can manage it. Maybe you can create a, uh, a meta graph of, of how many things you're tracking over time and, and uh, see, make sure you don't go too high. I don't know, that's maybe what my next project. But at the end of the day, some people are worried about all this data being created on the web. And my, my opinion is I'm kind of like, I don't know what you'd call it, just like, I, I do care, but at the same time, I know at the end of the day, probably the NSA is, going, is like listening to everything. And by the transit property, Snowden is also looking at all my data. So I'm kind of like, I don't know, but I totally understand if, if you don't want your GPS data somewhere on the, the internet, um, but I, I think it's uh, pretty secure and I, I know there are ways to, um, at least for the methods I've showed you today, there are ways to remove that, so that's why I feel confident with these, these methods I've shown today. Um, but at the end of the day, these guys probably already have it. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's it, thank you, I appreciate it.